Life Audio. Christian Parent Crazy World with Katherine Seegers is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Christian Parent Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you be a godly parent in an ungodly world. I am your host, Katherine Seegers, and in today's episode, we will tackle this very intriguing question. What question do many parents never ask God? Yeah, there's a little mystery in this episode. I will reveal what that question is soon, I promise. But first, today I'm going to let you in on a little inside baseball, so to speak. I'm going to share with you a little behind the scenes of how this podcasting thing works with my guests. And then I'm going to share with you part of my personal testimony that you probably don't know. And then I'm going to share with you part of a post-interview conversation that I had with my most recent guest, Kirsten Vossler. Sometimes these conversations get very lively and fascinating. And in the process, I'm going to unpack a question that many, perhaps most parents never ask God, and they really, really should. That's the plan for this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World. So let's get started. Have you ever felt conflict between your faith and feelings? If so, you're not alone. My name is Carly Mercouillier. I'm a licensed therapist and the host of the Therapy and Theology podcast, where we explore popular topics and questions related to faith, feelings, and spiritual formation. I want to invite you to join me every Thursday as we fearlessly name the complexities of our reality, grow in the awareness of who we are, and rediscover the power and purpose of our unique stories through the lens of the gospel. Subscribe today at lifeaudio.com. The Historical Jesus Podcast is the sweeping saga of the life and times of Galilean Jesus of Nazareth, as well as the faith, religion, and church founded to honor and disseminate his acts and teachings. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this fascinating journey through time, exploring the many great works of Christian theology, literature, architecture, music, and art inspired by the words and deeds of Jesus Christ. So we're going to start with a little inside baseball here, mamas and papas. For those of you who aren't sports fans, that analogy just means I'm going to give you a behind the scenes look at podcasting. You know, most of the time I interview someone, I am meeting them for the first time. I've, you know, I've usually done a good bit of research. I've listened to their podcast or read their articles or book or whatever is on the topic that we're going to be speaking on, but I don't know them personally. So we are usually getting acquainted for the first few minutes just before I hit record and then, you know, we're off to the races. Often we may interview each other on our respective shows, but there's not a lot of history between us. Such was the case with my most recent guest, Kirsten Vossler. But I tell you... (laughs) The two of us were like instant buddies right out of the gate. We could have talked all afternoon. And after we stopped the interview, the official interview, that is, Kirsten and I went on talking for quite some time (laughs) while our kids were probably starving or destroying something very expensive. But, you know, that post-interview conversation was so fascinating, and it veered into a topic that I really wanted to address with you today. That topic is a question that a lot of Christian parents don't seek the Lord about. My husband and I didn't, like not for the first 20 years, (laughs) two decades of our marriage. That question is, drumroll please, should God have a say in the size of your family? Okay, okay, I know that some of you have just tensed up like quite a bit. (laughs) In fact, you may be reaching for the stop button. I know I would have in those first two decades of our marriage. Believe me, I did tense up whenever anyone would broach this topic. Frankly, (laughs) actually, I would get angry, like really angry. And I want to urge you to relax a bit 
I'm not going full on quiverful for those of you who know what that means. I promise you I am not. And I'm not judging anyone based on what their family looks like. I am so not qualified to do that. But I do want to ask a question that is a little tough. It was for me. And that question is, have you allowed God to be the Lord of your family? And by that, I mean what your family looks like, like how many little lives you bring into the world or adopt or or foster. And right off the bat, I want to say that for some of you, that might mean that your family looks a lot smaller than you imagined or even dreamed. I'm going to talk about a couple of women, very godly, mature women who that happened to. And then, you know, there's me. I didn't want to have any kids. And now I have five who I will be homeschooling until I'm a senior citizen or Jesus returns, whichever comes first. And frankly, I am really praying for the latter because it keeps getting crazier down here. But let's be clear. Making God the Lord of your family can rub both ways. You may end up bigger than what you originally wanted or smaller than you originally wanted. But I want to set the stage by sharing some of my personal testimony with you and an experience I had about five years ago at a conference. I I wrote an article about it, and to date, it is one of my favorite articles articles that I have ever written. It's called, Should God Have a Say in the Size of Your Family? So I'm going to post that for you in the links on Life Audio and on my website. But then I'm going to let you listen to this little portion of my introduction and post-conversation with Kirsten, because our private chat really complements this question. So you may have pieced together parts of my testimony if you've if you've listened to this show for any length of time. But like like I said, I was a woman who was not interested in being a mom. Ask anybody who knew me, like back in my twenties and thirties, I was not the mothering type. I say that knowing full well that I had a huge maternal streak when it came to animals, but not babies of the non-furry kind, the kind that you have to burp and feed and change diapers and get up in the middle of the night with. Yeah, no interest in that. I was very career-driven, very goal-oriented, all about building the old resume. And I I think I mentioned this in the post-conversation with Kirsten, but (laughs) my father-in-law bet me a quarter on my wedding day that we would be pregnant in the first year. Keep listening to hear what happened with that bet. (laughs) But in all honesty, I was very influenced by modern secular feminism. And when someone would talk to me about having babies, something fierce and virulent would would rise up inside of me. And I, I, I would spout out, I do not want to be measured by what my body can produce. I want to be measured by what my mind can produce. Yeah, yeah. I was a little angry back then. Now, look, I, I do want to say, I always respected women who became mothers. Truly, I did. But I just thought that we were cut from a different cloth, you know. So so when it came to family and motherhood, I was far more influenced by our culture than I was by the heart of God and his word, especially when it came to what my family would look like. Now, mind you, we went to church every week. We were faithful tithers. We were involved in small groups and other activities in the church. But I had no interest in expanding our family. I wanted to expand my resume. So I never even bothered to ask God what he wanted my family to look like. Uh, But then in my early 30s, I had... I had this image of myself that got stuck in my head. I'm quite sure it was from the Holy Spirit. I, you know, I guess you could call it a vision. I don't know. But I, I saw myself like older and grayer in my mid-60s, surrounded by these little kids who were not my own. <laughs> they were the grandchildren of my brothers and sisters. And I would watch them opening gifts on on birthdays and at Christmas. And I would see them playing games and sports. And then I would see them graduating and getting married. Meanwhile, I was sitting there rocking back and forth and back and forth in my old chair, clinging 
to her resume. <sighs> Man, that, ugh, that vision haunted me. And the following question just reverberated in my spirit like a, like a clanging bell on a very distant, cloudy day. It whispered, will that resume mean to you in your old age what it means to you now? I couldn't shake that question. And I knew deep inside that it wouldn't, that one day I would regret valuing that resume over a family. <laughs> so I am not proud to say it, but fear of regret is what got us to the starting gate when it came to our family. But I did. I, I traded in my life under the spotlight on the stage, belting out show tunes to thousands of theater goers every year for some fluorescent kitchen light bulbs standing on a linoleum floor singing lullabies to an audience of one, and then two, and then three, and four, and five. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself there. Uh, you see, we were done with our family after the first three. I, I turned 39, and I thought that only crazy people and celebrities had babies in their 40s, and I was not either of those. Well, okay, so I wasn't a celebrity. But I, I started having these these dreams of a little boy, like, over and over, night after night. And I, I asked the Lord who that was because it kept showing up in my dreams. And I felt the Lord impress on my spirit that he was not done with our family. I was done, but he wasn't. And he asked me, so do you think you have a better plan than me? <laughs> okay, so that was a really tough question to answer because honestly, I did. I was like, if you want me to go back to baby town in my 40s, then yeah, yeah, I'm afraid I do think I have a better plan than you, God, which is clearly a problem because you're God and I'm not. So I, I was at a bit of an impasse because I kept having these dreams and God kept calling me to surrender this part of my life, but I didn't want another baby. Mm -hmm. So, so he, here's what I, I did do. I prayed a very wise prayer. I recommend this for all of you. I said, you know, if this is you, God, and frankly, I hope it isn't. I hope it's just some really bad Chinese food. But if, if this is you and you want us to have another child, then change my heart. And I, I offered my heart to God genuinely, honestly, and freely. Are you concerned about tensions in the Middle East? Do you wonder where we're currently at in the biblical timeline? Are we really in the last days? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Carl Muller with the Inside the Epicenter podcast. Every week, my co-host, best-selling author Joel Rosenberg, and I answer those questions and more. You'll hear inside knowledge of our meetings with leaders at the highest levels of government in the U.S., Israel, and the Middle East, equipping you to filter the news with biblically sound insights. Find Inside the Epicenter on your favorite podcast app or go to joshuafund.com to listen and subscribe. And over the course of the next six months, God did a really profound work in my heart. And I, I realized I was going to have to talk to my husband about this because, you know, that's how babies are made because, you know, I couldn't really leave him in the dark there. And, yeah, you know, I did talk to him, actually, on the way home from my 20-year 20 year college reunion. That was such a shocker for him. Poor guy. But, you know, I let him go off and kind of wrestle with this whole area of surrender with the Lord like I had. Meanwhile, I had this incredible, divinely orchestrated encounter. No, you know, there's just really no other way to put it. I went to a Christmas party with some other homeschooling moms, and there was this woman there. Her name was Beth, still is, as far as I know. Now, Beth had four kids. Her youngest kid, her youngest child was like 10, and she was 43 at the time, and she was pregnant with her fifth. And I'm like, what is up with that? Because there was definitely a story there, right? So I asked her if her fifth child was a surprise, and she told me, no, that God had convicted her and her husband about being open to his plan for her family. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> you are like singing my song here. You're you're telling me my own story. The same thing was happening to her that, you know, that was happening to me. And I'm like, what is this contagious or something? I, I don't know. It was wild. But interestingly, 
This is so fascinating. At the same table, there was this other woman. Her name was Amber. Still is probably. Now, now Amber was a really mature woman of God. So was Beth, obviously. And she had two kids. Her second child was such a miracle story. This little guy is named Zeke. And they told Amber that he, that he wasn't going to make it past the first trimester. But he did. And then they said he wouldn't make it past the second trimester, but he did. And then the third trimester, you know, and he did. And then they told her that he wouldn't survive labor, but he did. And they said, you know, he wouldn't survive the first few months. And he did. Fast forward, like this this kid, Zeke, he's like eight at this point, and he's perfectly healthy. And at each point, when Amber was given that negative report, she responded with proclamations and prayer, like in Emphatic, authoritative, warring mama kind of prayer declaring that Zeke is going to be healthy and whole. <laughs> and he is. Now, look, okay, I just have to acknowledge that God doesn't always answer our prayers the way that we hoped he would. I just did a powerful episode on that, two episodes actually, with Andy Howard on that topic. But this is one of those instances where God answered Amber's prayers just the way she hoped he would. But then Amber shared that she had always wanted to have four kids. And after she and her husband had Zeke, her husband felt like their family was complete. So they were at a (laughs) complete impasse, actually. She was growing more and more discontent and bitter with her husband and with her smaller family. So, like me, Amber went and prayed about it. And she got a very different answer from the Lord. God did not encourage her to continue pursuing motherhood. Rather, he impressed on Amber's heart that she needed to be content with what he had given her. So she gave her heart to God and God made her content with the two children she had. Another story, just this is a quick one. My best friend is named Susan. Shout out, Susan. Love you. Uh, She is one of nine kids and always thought that she would have a whole mess of kids, like a really large family. But God blessed her and her husband, Brian, with one child. He is her Isaac, just like Abraham and Sarah. Only his name is Drew, but, you know, she he's her Isaac. And they only had one child in scripture. That was God's plan. And Isaac and Rebecca, they only had two children. That was God's plan for their family. And, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a few friends that I know. I won't say their names, but they desperately, desperately wanted to have children and are now past their childbearing years and they don't have kids. And I don't know why, but God did not open the womb. The point I'm making here is that I I don't think every person is supposed to crank out as many babies as you can possibly have in your childbearing years. I I, I don't think God calls us all to do that. Some of us, yes, but, but not everyone. The point is, is that we need to be open to what God plans for our family to be. And here's something really cool. Love this. One of those couples who desperately wanted to have kids and didn't, they are now in the process of purchasing a farmhouse, like a a really large farmhouse with 10 acres in order to rehabilitate women who have been sex trafficked. (sighs) How amazing is that? Seriously, they will be parenting young women who desperately need godly role models in their lives. They will be a mother and a father. To these lost and hurting women. So beautiful. Okay, so uh, I need a tissue. Back to the Christmas party with Beth and Amber. Okay, so I left that party convinced that God wanted to bless our family again. And here's the cool thing. God had changed my heart so completely that I wanted to have another child worse than I had ever wanted anything in my whole life. (laughs) Oh, God, that was Amazing. Cliff Notes version. God changed my husband's heart as well. And he blessed us with not one, but two more kids. That's a whole other story, which I've chronicled on this show. But anyways, that's how we got there, which brings me to the article I wrote a few years ago. The impetus for the article was this this conference I went to, which was all about growing your church, how to expand your church 
family. And at the time, I was I was nursing our fifth child. So I was in the nursing room of this huge international sold out conference, people coming from all over the world. And, and I was sitting across from a woman who was nursing her second child. And she was she was talking about all the things she and her husband wanted to do in their ministry and in life. So they, you know, they weren't sure if they wanted to have another child, which, you know, is fine. Honestly, I told totally related to everything she said, because like I said, that's exactly where I had been the first 20 years of our marriage. But I couldn't shake the juxtaposition, (laughs) the irony of being at a conference that was all about growing your church family, people coming from all over the world, seeking the face of God on how to do that, and yet never asking the Lord what my personal family is supposed to look like. I'm like, what? (laughs) And maybe it was supposed to be just two kids for them. I don't know. That isn't up to me. The point is, if we call Jesus Lord, then it should be up to him, right? So we need to ask him. So I'm there in the nursing room and I asked this woman point blank. So so what does God have to say about what your family should look like? (laughs) I'll never forget. She just stared at me blankly. The question clearly had never crossed her mind, just like it had never crossed mine, like for two decades. Again, so ironic because, you know, she'd travel across the country to learn about growing her church family. And yet she had never really asked God about her personal family, right? Oh, gosh, I think this is where so many Christians are at. My family should look like what I'm comfortable with, what I want, what is convenient for me, what I can afford. Oh, man. I get it. I get it, mamas and papas. I've been there. I know. Oh, but the blessing that comes from surrender and saying yes to what the Lord plans. It's just so beautiful. One more quick story from that conference before I get to my conversation with Kirsten. I promise. I promise it's coming. But this story is so cool. Uh, Later at the same conference, I sat in that same nursing room and shared my testimony with another nursing mama. And here's what I wrote in the article. Um, Quote, another mom sat across from me with babe in tow. And this time she told me her story. She and her husband were ministers. And she offered this confession. She said, my husband and I weren't going to have kids. We thought that we could do so much more for God's kingdom if we weren't burdened with children. Then one day as I was praying, God stopped me cold. He said, that is an abortion mindset. That is not my mindset. Her words stunned me. I never thought of it that way, but I knew that she was right. I'd heard this narrative over and over from the lips of others and sadly from my own. Upon announcing that I was pregnant in my 40s again, I got comments from some of my Christian friends saying things like, "Uh, better you than me, and you're living my worst nightmare. (laughs) I'm not kidding. That last one came from a woman at church right after the sermon. She told me that children would interfere with her ability to travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our culture tells us that life is a burden when it's too old or too young or too expensive or too inconvenient. We can do so much more for ourselves without it. That mindset has seeped into the church when we think that we can do so much more for God without it. The idea that what we do in this life is more important than who we do it for is an abortion mindset. It places productivity over people. It places our goals over God's. I'm going to link that article in the show notes. I, I highly recommend that you give it a read. It's it's one of my favorites. Yeah, Look, I know I've given you a lot to think about today. And I want to end this episode with with a bit of the introduction that I had with Kirsten and then my post-conversation with her. But before I do, let me just say that I I, I would still be serving God right now if I hadn't said yes to Seegers number four and five. I would still be God's beloved daughter. I would still be a part of his family. But I am so, so glad that I got on board with what he wanted to do. His plan is best. 
All of my children are a gift from heaven, as are yours. And the ministry for sex traffic women that God is giving my friends who don't have kids, that is a gift too. The point is, God's plan is best. So ask him what that is. Here's the rest of my conversation with Kirsten Vossler. Tell us how you came to be a mom of eight (laughs) amazing kiddos. Well, yes. So here's the thing. People often ask me and assume, well, you must be from a big family. Is your husband from a big family? And no, we're from very average sized families. I'm the oldest of three. My husband is the third of four. And we neither. So neither of us are from a giant family. And yet we came into our marriage and then into parenthood with just a, a true love for children. I am a total kid person. So I have to say that because not everybody is, but I am a total kid person. I've been babysitting and just loving on kids since I was tiny, always wanted to have a big family and really had no idea if that's what God had for me or not, but just had a heart, a heart and a desire for that. And my parents, even though they only had three children, only had three children, (laughs) um, because that's a lot in today's era. It is more than the average. Yeah. So they had three children, but they had such a heart and they understood God's heart for children is what Mm -hmm. I should say. So they were married for 13 years before they were even able to get pregnant. And then God miraculously gave them me and then my two siblings. And so all through my growing up, there was always this emphasis on like, God loves children. Children are a blessing. God has a great plan for for his children that he brings into the world. And so I came into marriage with that. In fact, one of the first conversations my husband and I had on like the deep topics when we first started dating was, um, how many kids or like how, you know, cause I was like, I really feel like God has a, has in store for us what he has in store for us, you know? And we, and so he, anyway, we had this whole conversation about it. Come to find out we were very much on the same page, which has been such a blessing that we're both open to whatever amount of children the Lord has for us. And we actually have nine children and, um, I have my, I haven't updated everything out there. <laughs> oh yeah. So I read and your so website we have- eight. Yes. So we have a new, a new little guy who's a year old now. And I think that reminds me, I need to update my, (laughs) my website. I I had, yeah, I had some people (laughs) bugging me about my podcast. They're like, you got to update your podcast intro because it says eight kids and you just had a baby, right? Yes. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, so yeah. So we have nine children now. And so we're just open to what God gives us, but it is, it has been really a dream come true for me. And it's such a joy and a blessing. Like it it really is. And the more kids we have and the older our children get, the more that becomes true. I feel like, like it's just, I I've told people when their kids get to be like six, like seven, eight years old, it's like, you're entering the payoff years. Mm. These are the years where all the hard, hard work, the really exhausting physical work you put in, in those beginning and middle, like early elementary years suddenly starts to, you start to see the payoff, you start to see the results. Mm. And so we're starting to see that our oldest is 14 now. And we're just starting to see that like, oh, wow, things have really changed. We're in such a different season now than we were when we had like, you know, four kids, four and under. Mm. Such a different season. So it's, that it's is the hardest a blessing. Yes. Yeah. Those early ones, because, uh, you know, we, uh, you've got me, you've got four more than I do, but a lot of people are like, oh, five kids, but, and they're, they're like, dealing with one or two under the age of three or four, you know, and I'm like, those are the hardest years when you don't have a kid who can, Hey, go throw this away for mommy. Or, Hey, can you make a PB and J or can you just hey, buckle your own car seat or wipe <laughs> your own bottom for that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, you're right. But it does start to pay off and you have lots of little hands that can help out and you homeschool as well. Right. We do. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I could have guessed as much. The bigger the family, the more likely. I know. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's funny how true. that goes hand in hand. Where, <laughs> uh, have you ever seen Tin Hawkins do his, um, his bits on homeschooling families? They're I so don't, right. I, I know who he is. I don't know if I've seen those exactly. Oh, I'm going to have to post some of those. They're absolutely hilarious. Just how, you know, he had one where it was kind of done to the Adams family theme song. Cause we're, <laughs> we're just a little odd, aren't we? <laughs> we are a little yeah. odd, but I think we're really cool. And hey, we're, 
raising some really amazing kids. And so so are the parents out there that have their kids in other school systems. But yeah, we're we're a little wacky and we kind of embrace that, don't we? <laughs> we do. We do. And now you can be a fly on the wall for our post interview conversation. Ooh, long day. Go, go have some ice cream. <laughs> I know. I do love ice cream, my dear. Oh, me too. <laughs> I know. I had a guy on my show recently. I kind of railed him about it. He doesn't like ice cream. I'm like, what? what? Oh, I know. <laughs> Talk about childhood drama. I'm like, something must have happened back there because that's yeah. not right. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm just curious. You think y'all just keep going as whatever the Lord gives? Well, yes. In fact, I'm That's pregnant awesome. with number 10. Oh, no. <laughs> I am. Yeah, I didn't say I'm like, I told it's not a secret, but uh-huh. I haven't like said I'm like, I don't know when we're going to release these different episodes. And I haven't when, said anything yet. <laughs> when's your, uh, when does this edition come out? So March. March. Anybody approached you about a reality uh-huh. TV show yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'd probably turn them down in a heartbeat. Oh, no, <laughs> no. kidding. Sorry. <laughs> that's amazing that uh pregnant with the tent that's awesome i actually did a sh- <laughs> i wrote an article a while back i love this article it was should god have a say in the size of your family because there oh. were really so many people and frankly myself for the first i was in my 40s before i really surrendered that to the lord and really started to seek him and that's why we had two more kids in my 40s because i i, I surrendered that and the lord really convicted me that i had not put him first he was Lord, but he wasn't Lord of my family in my womb. And I'm like, well, you know, that was quite a journey. And it ended up taking me back to the maternity ward twice in my 40s. Yeah. Which I'm really grateful for. Because so these neat. two little seekers wouldn't exist. But there is a, a very, very strong mentality within the church that is very secular. And that is that my family looks like what, you know, I'm con- in control of that. I should be in control of yeah. that. And I, yeah. I, I have a friend, one of my best friends in the world. She came from a family. She was one of nine. Okay. And she wanted a very big family and the Lord blessed them with one. Yeah. And the, you know, he's her he, Isaac, his name is Drew, but just the one. And, yeah. and that's what the Lord gave her. And I've had other friends that wanted more than they had. I have some yeah. friends that have none and I, that's up to the Lord, but being open to what his plan is, I think is critically important. And yeah. clearly you guys are that. So yes. Well, I, and I, I mean, I'm, you know, absolutely same thing. It's just like, and I tell my kids that too, like, yeah. you know, what do you think about a big family? Like, Oh, we want to have this many, you know, we have like lots of kids. And I'm like, the thing is we never know how many God's going to give us. <laughs> right. You, we all assume that and you know i mean there is partly truth to it right we all assume well if i give god my womb that you know if Mm -hmm. i actually let him be in control of every area of my life that i'm gonna have a million children you know like we're gonna have 45 kids right maybe but you might have one you might have three i mean my parents had three right (laughs) you know what i mean like it so yeah it's definitely mean it's all through scripture like god opens and closes the womb i mean look at the women in in scripture who had one or two children are your parents really supportive then both sides really supportive that's good they really are it's such a blessing it's such a blessing yeah yeah i wondered how my parents would be my mom would be because in your 40s i i don't know how you look i'm 40 are you 40 i'm 40 i mean they say that there's all these increased risks and whatever i'm like i have to blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My doctor didn't even go there and I'm glad she didn't because I was, you know, oh, I believe we've got to listen to the Lord on that one. And oh yeah. Um, I had two perfectly I now I did have a rocky road, I'm not gonna lie. My fifth one, we we and the Lord prepared me completely for it. But we spent a lot of time in the hospital. I started abrupting at 26 weeks. Oh, man. So, And I don't, that's not necessarily an age thing, you know, although right. it can be. It, it, it's more common when you get older. But I mean, the Lord was faithful when we pr- had prayed so much for this child. So she was, she was perfectly healthy and whole. And so, yeah, I, I had two baby, like at 43 and at almost, I was almost 46. So I love I that. I know. I you, love that. So yeah, much. So when I hear about ladies in their forties having babies, one of my yeah. one of my friends growing up, her mom had her last baby at forty five, and I was just always like, "Oh, that's so cool." Yeah, yeah. And I have to say, like, there is something really special to me this time. Like, I'm I, 
I mean, I love kids. I love babies. I love, I love being yeah. pregnant. I love giving birth. Like I'm kind of weird all in, the, in all those ways, but yeah, but I, there is something unique and special about being pregnant now at 40. Yeah. It's different than it was even just like a year and a half ago <laughs> with my, with my last one. And I'm just like, this is really special. Like I'm not yeah. taking it for no. granted that I have, you know, how many more years? I don't know. Like, will, you know, could I have three more kids? Maybe I will. I don't know, but I might have zero more. Like this might right. be the last one. I, the last one could have been the last one. I don't know. Oh, you know, yeah. so there is just something really sweet and special. I feel this time that's just like, oh, this is really nice. Thank you, Lord. Like this for like an extra blessing mm. being 40, you know, even though 40 is not old. <laughs> Like, no, although I was at a ball game the other day and somebody asked me which kid on the team was my grandkid. And I'm like, Stop it. and he could be, I mean, I had him at 43. <laughs> he could be my grandkid, but he ain't. I don't like thinking I, I look like him as a grandmother, but whatever. Uh, so, yeah, so that starts to happen. And technically, you know, I was the granny on the maternity ward floor more than one time, actually. <laughs> yeah. At least twice, if not more, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And I, I think I'm, I'm with you. I think pregnancy in your forties, I, you do sense something different about it. It's because, you know, at some point in the not too distant future, yeah, this, this, this will be the last time this womb gets used in such a way. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I know we've gotten there. I'm kind of perimenopausal towards menopause and so and the lord told me five so i was pretty confident of that anyways but yeah i'm so glad that i listened to the lord's direction on the size of our family because there are two more people that yeah. that wouldn't exist if we hadn't been open to his plan and yeah. i mean in retrospect i wish i'd been more open early in our marriage we waited 10 years but you know god <laughs> God is, I can't complain. God has blessed us so much. That's so good. I know. That's kind of my, my mother-in-law's story was similar. They waited like, I think like five years or something. And in, after my husband was older, I mean, you know, like in their, when their kids were all grown, Mm -hmm. they were like, man, we have, you know, we have four kids, but wow. Like what else would God have given us if we'd been open? Yeah. I've wondered that. You know, so she was, so she was all, so she was like pounding that, not pounding, but you know, pouring that into my husband, just don't limit God, like right. be open to what he has. And so yeah, it's been a major blessing for us. So no, yeah, I, I do think of that some, I don't try to dwell in it, but yeah, I spent most of my twenties just chasing stuff for me, you know, mm-hmm. and, and in retrospect, none of that matters now, none of it, you <laughs> I know. know, but you know, I know. but what an point. amazing, I mean, I just, but your story is amazing and your story is going to like impact so yeah. many people and your own children, you know, yeah. I mean, that's like my, yeah, like my, my mother-in-law, she was just like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, and now look, her part of her heritage is that she has, yeah. you know, 10, well, more than because he has a brother with two little boys, but Wow. Like, you know, like here, here we are. Look at this heritage that may have not been the same if he hadn't been mm-hmm. brought up with that mentality of like, oh yeah, children are a blessing. We don't have to take matters mm-hmm. into our own hands. It really was a cultural mindset. I remember oh, when oh, it I definitely was, is. I, my father-in-law bet me a quarter on my wedding day. I'd be pregnant in the first year. And I told him, oh, <laughs> I won't have a baby in the first decade. And then this is hilarious. <laughs> Nine years, 364 days later. Oh, we had my our goodness. First child. I'm like, oh. God, you, you have, you have such a sense of humor <laughs> Lost because your it was just one day before a decade. <laughs> we had our first child. I'm like, that's hilarious. Oh, um, that's amazing. I know. And I am grateful for what I learned in that, that decade of time and what I was able to do because it, it does, it has resurfaced and the creativity that I was able to experience all the things that I was able to experience and, you know, pursuing my graduate degree and spending a dozen years doing theater and everything from Shakespeare to musicals to comedy. Which is so so, fun. It was. And I'm teaching comedy improv now. And so, you know, it's, it's wonderful. I'm at our homeschool co-op. I am. It's so, so fun. Oh my goodness. You know, I don't, I don't regret. I don't, but I mean, that's part of God's plan, you know, and, and, but he works with us. He doesn't. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, there occasionally we we our plans get usurped, but for the most part, he's a gentleman. We're I'm so glad that we were open when we were, and I'm so glad that we I listened to the Lord because we were done after the first three done, yeah. and it was just the Lord's pressing on my heart. You know, why do you call me Lord and I'm not Lord of this part of your life? I'm like God. <laughs> You're telling me this now. We're really? like 43. <laughs> like, seriously, that's what you should have said when I was 23. <laughs> but it was a lot of that cultural mindset that I've come. And I be- I do believe, I see myself as the Anna Betty, anti- anti-Betty Fridan from the Feminine Mystique. She yeah. talked about how all these women used all of their productive earning years and resume building years raising kids. Well, I kind of waited a little bit, did that, and now I'm here, you know, I'm going to be homeschooling till I'm a senior citizen, and I don't care. Mm -hmm. Um, Me too. (laughs) But just, this is so much more fruitful and rewarding than anything I put on my resume. That, like, that resume, seriously? Yeah. That's just, it's just kindling. It's kindling now. I don't even know where it is. I don't even know what is on it anymore. I remember doing the shows, but... Nobody cares. It, yeah. It's it's irrelevant. It's less than irrelevant. What's relevant are the five little people who look look a lot like me and my husband who who we've invested in, and that's just another crazy journey that's that's got its ups and downs and struggles. I mean, I'm grateful for waking up to the Lord's plan for my life, and I think He. It's weird admit to you now I I've, I wrote that ebook a couple years ago and I haven't really promoted it like I wanted to and I really want to get out there and speak on it because that's the book I want to write that's the book it's called mere mother is the book I want to write it's about how motherhood became something so marginalized and mere in our culture and it starts with with the early days of feminism and those great amazing women like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Ma. How did we end up here? I'm not sure who the book is for because not every mom wants to read that. So I'm trying, we're trying to figure that out, but I need to be out there kind of promoting this because I know a lot of women feel those myths and feel marginalized Mm -hmm. by it. Mm -hmm. We, if we can recognize it and counteract it with our God given calling and dignity and worth, and value yes. the fact that we're doing kingdom eternal work then then yeah. that's that's what i want to be promoting along with the other stuff I, I god's opened these other doors with my podcast so i invest in that in yours as well that's so yeah. so so cool but yeah. it's been awesome talking to you i hope we can keep in touch you too and yes let's lovely. let's do it <laughs> Thanks for sticking around, you guys. The ebook I just referred to is called Beyond the Lies, Uncovering Five Myths Our Culture Spreads to Mothers. That work is truly a labor of love. It is the result of years of studying our culture's perspective on motherhood. You know, I almost missed it. I almost missed the best part of my life. I almost missed being a mom because I didn't think that motherhood would fulfill me. (sighs) How wrong I was. I'm so grateful that I came to have God's heart for children. Now, I discussed those myths on Kirsten's show recently, that's uh, Rejoicing in Motherhood, and I'll be discussing them here on CPCW in the new year. I'll post a link to that interview with Kirsten, and you can get the ebook for free by subscribing at katherineseegers.com. Until next time, hold your heads high, mamas and papas, because parenting is high and holy work all of it from from the feedings to the diaper changes to the wiping bottoms to the educating and planting a spiritual seed to the wrestling alongside your kids to help them make the faith their own to the prayer filled days and nights that sometimes seem like they're never going to end to the shoving these little birdies out of the nest to make their way in the world it's all holy It's all sacred. Thank you for letting me be a part of your parenting journey. And thank you for being a part of mine. I want to thank you for joining me today. Look, I know 
There are a lot of things you could be listening to right now, and I really appreciate that you took this time to spend with me. I hope you will join me for my next podcast when we take aim at some aspect of our culture that threatens to derail our parenting and steal our kids' faith. If you enjoyed this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World, would you consider telling a friend and sharing it on social media and giving it a good review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and following me on Facebook and Instagram? Oh, oh, and maybe you could say that Christian Parent Crazy World is the best podcast you've ever heard in your entire life. You know, uh, j- just a thought. Uh, And be sure to check out my website, which is katherineseegers.com. That's Catherine with a C. I have lots of articles and resources there that will help you on your parenting journey. And if you subscribe, I will be sure to send you some really cool free stuff and notify you of future podcasts, articles, and blogs. I want to end this and every episode with a word of encouragement. God gave you your kids, your specific kids for a reason. That's because you hold the key to unlocking who God created them to be. We'll see you next time. Christian Parent Crazy World is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hey there, it's Carly Mercouli, your host of Therapy and Theology, a weekly podcast that explores popular topics and questions related to faith, feelings, and spiritual formation. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com.